Hi everyone, welcome to our, our third edition of our ASX education series. Um, it's great to be with you again. Today we'll talk a little bit firstly about the ASX indices and, and many of you will read the, pick up the paper, you'll listen to the, uh, the news um, and various media outlets and they'll refer to, uh, particularly in Australia, they'll refer to things like the All Ordinaries Index. Now the All Ordinaries Index, a lot of you might ask, what the hell is that? <laughs> Um, it, it, it really, the All Ordinaries Index, the first thing you probably need to know about it is it's the average of the top 500 companies in Australia. And what do we define as the top 500 companies? And what the, uh, they're measured by from 1 through to 500 is their mark, well, thing we call market capitalization. That is, in essence, their total worth of the company. Um, so the top 10 companies in Australia are, are names that you'll know and are the biggest companies um, on the share market, such as BHP, Commonwealth Bank, ANZ, all the four big banks are there, uh, Woolworths, um, and so on. So the All Ordinaries Index um, is made up of the top 500 of those. You will note, note that within that index, the top probably, I think probably 10 or 12, make up more than 50% of the total size of that. So the top 10 or 12 have the most influence over the All Ords Index going up and the All Ords Index going down. Um, there are overall, there's more than 2,000 stocks listed on the Australian share market and therefore the rule probably, once you drop below the, the number 500, the other 1,500 um, are very small in size um, relative to the, to the BHPs of the world. Um, one of the things you need to understand too is the All Ords Index is, um, doesn't include the returns in it as you measure it. If it, if it goes up 1%, for example, and if it goes up from 5,500 points to uh, 5,550, it means on the day the whole market went up on average 1%. So that means that there are still going to be some companies, if the market went up, there's still going to be some companies that went down. But on the average, that top 500 went up, their share prices went up by 1%. Now what that doesn't include, the All Lords Index, it doesn't include dividends. So any dividends that got paid by Commonwealth Bank or BHP or Woolworths, those, those dividends that were paid out are stripped out of the index and don't get factored in at all. If you want a true representation of what the total return of the market is with including capital growth and income is a thing called the All Lords Accumulation Index. And you can feel free to go online and you type in that, you'll, you'll figure out how that works and you can see charts of that as well. But the All Lords Accumulation Index will include dividends. Now, I think the other thing you probably will read a lot about is um, there are indexes all over the world. So you'll hear about the, the Dow Jones Index, for example, which is a lot of people place a lot of emphasis on, but a lot of people forget that it's, it's only the top 20 stocks in the US. That's it, top 20. And yet we hear about the Dow Jones Index over and over and over and over again. What a better measure of the US share market is, is called the S&P 500, which is the top 500 companies in the US. That's a broader measure. Then you've got other um, indexes that people quote a lot called the NASDAQ. Uh, the, uh, the NASDAQ is typically very uh, tech heavy and health uh, heavy index, and that um, separates out those companies. Then you've got the Nikkei, which is the Japanese index. Um, what do we have? The, the Hang Seng, which is the Hong Kong index. Um, and, and, you know, various, um, the DAX, which is the DAX, which is the German index. And these indexes exist all around the globe. The other thing before I move off on this point of what you can follow is that the, the, in Australia we can also separate it down. You can follow indexes as low as the S&P, the top 20, the ASX 20 we call it. There's the ASX 50 which is the top 50 companies. There's the ASX 100. Um, uh, then there's the, a thing we call the S&P ASX uh, mid cap which is between all the companies between 50 and 100 stocks. And then there's the All Lords Small Order, or Small Ordinaries Index, which is everything between 100 and 300 uh, stocks. So um, there are various indexes that um, you can invest in through ETFs, you can and follow. Um, I think it's important you understand what sits behind those and what drives those. 
So when you're following the market and you're looking to invest, one of the things that we talk about within the Australian share market, for example, is the diversification amongst different sectors. And we mentioned this probably back in week one a little bit, where um, we, we call them the GIC sectors, G-I-C-X. Um, those sectors include things that you can invest in called like financials, resources, um, healthcare, uh, industrials, uh, information technology. But the one thing I really wanted to point out today, and you can look at the notes a little bit about how these sectors work, but the Australian share market, due to probably where it's been in history and where, it's, um, where it is currently now, is very heavily dominated with companies in two sectors and two sectors only. The, the res resources sector, which is your BHP, Rio Tinto, Fortescue's of the world, heavily dominated. And I think just off the top of my head, that would make up anywhere between 25 and 30% of the index. And the other big part of the, uh, the index is made up of the financials. So all our big four banks, um, particularly when then you add Macquarie Bank to that, you add um, financials like our financial uh, funds management companies like uh, Perpetual, Challenger, Magellan, and the financials then make up probably between 35 to 40% of the index. So between resources and financials, that's 60 to 75% of the overall index. We, we don't have a lot of exposure in Australia to information technology, healthcare, um, pharmaceuticals, or some of these now growing sectors like cybersecurity, um, robotics, artificial intelligence. And so I think when you're investing in Australia, you need to be pretty clear about what you're getting exposure to and what the sectors are. So now I just want to take a little bit more of a deep dive into how um, research analysts may look at trying to pick the right companies um, that they put buy recommendations on or sell recommendations on for that matter in, in a portfolio. And the first um, particular, I'm going to talk about two broad strategies here today. Um, the first one is what we call a top-down approach. And a top-down approach is simply where a, an analyst may sit and review uh, in Australia, for example, our, our broader political environment, it might look at our macroeconomics, it looks at the overall um, structure of the economy, it might look at broad factors like our exchange rates, it might look at our um, housing market in, in how many new homes are being built, it might look at our employment data, um, it might look at uh, our, our policies around uh, importing and exporting and, and immigration. And looking at all those policies together and saying, well, which one of those sectors at the moment is benefiting from, um, from those policies or, or those trends in the overall economy? And just to use an example at the moment, probably in the last six to 12 months, has been this huge government stimulus around the housing sector where people have been given government grants to uh, build. Interest rates are traditionally pretty low. The stimulus has caused a huge uh, influx in building uh, new homes and therefore um, the building sector has benefited from that. Taking that down a level, you then say, well, which companies might benefit from a building boom? So you might use Borrell or James Hardy as companies that might benefit from that. You might also then look at, well, if they're buying materials such as timber or steel, um, for example, then iron ore goes into steel. Steel is used for manufacturing and therefore iron ore stocks such as BHP, Fortescue or Rio might benefit. So a top-down approach looks at the broader macroeconomic issues, it then says which sectors will this benefit or disadvantage and then from that we then start to look at what individual stocks may or may not be worth doing or looking at. Once we get down to the stock level, we then look at what, is the, what are good and bad companies look like, what does their balance sheet look like, um, what does the management look like? What's their track record been? And from there, we start to weed out which stocks we want to own. So for example, though, where this top-down approach can get very, um, I, I suppose, skewed is that if you might end up, if you like a couple of sectors due to the macroeconomics, you may end up with a lot of stocks in those sectors, which from a diversification point of view may, may not be a great outcome. The second broad strategy that a lot of analysts might look at is, what is, is effectively the opposite, is called a bottom-up approach. 
that's where um, the uh, analysts will look at the broad universe of stocks, uh, say in the top 500, and then they'll create filters um, that might involve, um, you know, they might exclude companies with certain debt levels, they might exclude certain companies in certain industries such as maybe they have a, they want to have a ESG, environmentally friendly portfolio, so they exclude tobacco or gambling. They might then exclude companies that have got new management, for example, and, and they introduce or dividends that are, are above a certain level. And as they put all these filters in, that creates a list of companies that they then, it filters down their list to a point, uh, to a few companies that they are interested in. Um, then they will analyze those companies over and over again to create a short list of companies that then they have what we call high conviction over and then create uh, a portfolio to go and buy. Now, again, that short list may end up with companies all in the same sector. So they may be looking for high growth companies in and those high growth companies all seem to appear at the moment in, in, in certain, it may be in IT or healthcare. And again, it can skew the portfolio in a lot of different directions, um, depending on what gets spat out from that bottom up approach. But they don't, they're basically looking for good quality companies first and foremost. They're not necessarily analyzing whether the sector is a great sector to be in. They, they firstly pick the companies first and then weed it out um, the other way. Um, again, what you're going to find a lot with stock market analysis is that it's an art, not a science. There's no perfect way to do this. Everybody has their own opinion or own view of how to pick these stocks or how to pick these sectors. It doesn't mean they're right, it doesn't mean they're wrong, but it's important for you to understand that you, you will develop over time through your own information analysis, your own way of doing it. and. As long as you're comfortable with your, the way you approach it, that is great. And I would say stick to it. Um, you know, we've talked before a lot about having one voice and listening to one um, strategy. This is particularly relevant with this chat, is that have your strategy, stick to it, and, and yeah, review it and make sure it's working for you. But um, don't chop and change, because what strategies may work over for some for some uh, periods of time may not work over other periods of time and, and and if you're always chasing the best return every year you know I've found that some people can cause it can cause an enormous amount of grief so um, trying to don't try and be the best try and pick the best returns every year don't try and pick the best funds every year um, uh, try and maintain some consistency of approach and strategy just what, so when we're looking at different, um, particularly this top-down approach, a lot of people ask about where they can find information on macroeconomics and, and particularly on the economy. And what we find is a, is, is a great place to find some information is just simply at the RBA website, which is rba.gov.au. That can provide, they provide a, um, a statement of monetary policy, which is published quarterly. For those that really want to get in the nuts and bolts of, of looking at some economics and, and um, uh, looking at the commentary around the Australian economy, feel free to, to dive in there. I think that that's particularly good. Um, the other place that's got a lot of commentary even on a day-to-day -day and week-to-week -week basis on broader economic information is the Australian Financial Review. Um, it can be a little bit hard going at some times in terms of reading this, but in general it's a, it's a very good, um, uh, it's a very good um, provider of, of uh, information uh, both on Australian sector and Australian economy, economic point of view but also on a global point of view as well. So I just want to use this opportunity to talk a little bit about the different ways um, that you can hold shares and, and let's um, uh, just particularly go through three major options. Um, the first one that's very typical for most people to jump into is buying the direct shares yourself. You know we've talked about buying BHP, Commonwealth Bank, you make the decision to buy a company, you buy that, you, as we've talked about before, you can buy $500 worth of that and then you build the portfolio up yourself. If the, the, you are then um, trying to get, I would argue, an atypical, good, diversif a well diversified portfolio should get to between 12 and 18. Any more than 18, I believe you're nearly over diversifying and you, you, the stats would prove that you probably hold too many shares. Anything less than 12 and you're probably under diversifying and you really are running the risk that, um, that you're overexposed to certain areas. But that being said, so that's, that's option one um, where you pick the different um, sectors yourself and your different stocks yourself. Option two, um, as we've grown up, um, we've seen the 
um, the sector, the listed investment companies such as Argo, which is names you would have heard of Australian Foundation Investment. Um, Argo and AFI have been around for 100 years and, and you can buy those shares on the share market and what you're buying in essence is they're behind the scenes, they own the top 200, 250 stocks on the share market. They're, they've got their own team, they're looking at buying and selling those shares uh, on a daily basis, they're doing their own research and they're managing that portfolio on your behalf and therefore as that portfolio, if it goes up, you'll see the Argo share price go up and vice versa. If their portfolio is going down, then the Argo share price will go down. It's the, probably there's a little bit of, they'll publish the top 10 shares they own. You won't see the full list and they are relatively transparent around publishing how they're going because they have to report to the Australian Stock Exchange, I think, and they report their net tangible asset backing on a, a monthly basis. So. Um, that, that you don't miss, you won't obviously get to ring up the head of Argo and go, oh, I think you should buy BHP today, or I think you should sell your Woolworth shares today. You don't get to do that, and so you'll leave, you're investing your money with a professional team, and they look after it for you. Admittedly, you won't know what transactions are going on when because they're not going to notify you. Um, we've seen then the advent of exchange traded funds, which operate in a very similar fashion to Argo and AFI and you get, they have much broader scope to invest in different sectors and, and different areas of the market. But in essence, they trade exactly the same way through the Australian share market. The most recent one that I wanted to touch on today is, is an area which I think is going to grow enormously over the next 10 years. And for those that um, uh, have, have gone, been involved with the market, ET, exchange traded funds or ETFs as they're affectionately known, started probably 10 to 15 years ago and I, could see the growth of them 10 or 15 years ago and I can see now we're getting a thing called separately managed accounts, SMAs as they're affectionately known and now I can see the growth in them exploding over the next 10 years and the reason for that growth is for me quite simple and we use these, um, have been using these for the last few years for certain clients is that you get just an improved level of transparency and tax efficiency with separately managed accounts as opposed to managed funds or ETFs. And what happens is they will then be crystal clear. You get to see every single share on your portfolio that's beneficially owned by you that sits in that separately managed account. So you'll get to see on your portfolio if they've got Commonwealth Bank, BHP, Woolworths, Rio Tinto, whatever the portfolio holds. In addition to that, you'll also see that if they make a change in that portfolio, you'll see them sell Rio Tinto and buy Commonwealth Bank, for example. You'll see the dividends go into your bank account directly from those companies. And you so everything is absolutely transparent and see-through. Now, a lot of clients that are looking for that um, I'll call it understep that they, they don't want to still make the, the decisions still aren't theirs. There's still that money, those shares are being managed by a professional fund manager, but they want to have at least the transparency and the, and the, and the look through to know what's going on. Separately managed accounts can be absolutely awesome. And, and we, as I said, for the right set of clients and for the right circumstances, we think they're a great uh, mechanism for investing in the share market. So a few things just to finish up this part of the talk on. I, I just, some, some general tips I suppose we've, we've got in the notes. Never buy shares just on rumours alone. At the moment I would argue that a lot of people, in particular I'm seeing some behaviours at the moment right me of 1999 around the tech boom. But it, you know, if you go to the pub, you go out with your friends, everyone seems to have an opinion about everything these days. Um, do your own research. Make sure that if someone gives you a tip, great. Um, go away, look at it, speak to a professional, never simply just buy on a rumour alone. Um, the other probably tip I would give, and I, I, if it sounds too good to be true, it is. There is so many people that see returns advertised in, in papers and around the, the country, around the world, where there's a promise of um, magical returns at some levels that seem ridiculous and, and literally, you know, too good to be true. Invariably those things, um, I'll, I'll call it musical chairs, once the music stops on them, you'd better have a chair because if you don't have a chair, you're really gonna hit the ground. Um, probably if you invest in the share market, I want to say don't, um, don't, it's a sit and forget strategy, particularly when you're buying direct shares yourself, it can be invariably, um, can lead to poor results. 
in sense that the buy and hold, I, I sort of believe in that buy and hold mentality, but you've still got to keep an eye on trends. You still have to keep an eye on stocks that change management, you know, market conditions change, industries change. You need to be reviewing your portfolio all the time. And, and because the world has changed and, and COVID is a great example of that. I think I also see, as a general tip, people over diversify. They buy far too many stocks. They buy $500 of this, $1,000 of that, $10,000 of that. They end up with a list of 38 stocks. It is, it's a license for disaster in a sense that um, you, you, an individual cannot keep an eye on 38 stocks. Now I've got no problem with a fund manager owning 38 stocks because they have a team of people and analysts watching this stuff around the clock all year round. But as a, a retail investor, owning 38 stocks is impossible to keep track of. So, and, and there are the science and the data shows that you don't get that much, any extra return or diversification um, risk, uh, I'll call it um, aversion from uh, div diversifying much beyond 18 stocks, as long as you've got the right sectors um, in your portfolio. Um, make sure you check the liquidity of your investment. So when you're investing, we talked about liquidity in, in a previous uh, video, how long it takes for you to turn it into cash. Make sure you understand how liquid the investment is. Um, uh, you know, and, and I guess the last point that I wanted to make today is just make sure that you understand all of your, your transaction costs, make sure you know all the fees, be completely transparent um, and, and understand in terms of investigate what all the fees are around your uh, investments and your investment portfolio. So we've talked a lot today about direct investments. So where you can invest in um, direct shares, you can invest in, in, in listed investment companies like Argo or AFI, um, but you can also invest in um, you know, separately managed accounts. Now, that, that we use the word direct investments. That's where you're buying companies or investment vehicles that are directly listed on the Australian Stock Exchange, as an example. And, and direct investment gives you, um, you know, an enormous amount of advantages, such as liquidity. We've talked about being able to buy or sell a share and, and you can get your money within 48 hours. It gives you absolute daily valuations of your investment on a on a minute by minute basis. You know we've talked about market opening times. Um, it gives you a lot of uh, flexibility, some safeguards because you know that the ASX has certain rules around the investments, um, and and you you know you can buy and sell as I said when you wish um, and and ultimately we've talked about stamp duty and, and transaction costs so once you bought there's really no holding cost either in, in a sense that your portfolio is what it is um, and you don't get charged unless you're using an advisor or a fund manager to do that there are no other holding costs once the asset is purchased now you might ask well what how does that compare then to what, what the market knows as indirect investments? Now, indirect investments are what we call a managed investments or trusts. Now, indirect investments have been popular for, uh, I guess since I started in the industry 30 years ago, is that they've been, trusts are, um, uh, are a form of uh, an asset pool that, again, might own the top 200 stocks, but you don't get the ability to sell it when you, you know, trade it through the share market, you have to fill out an application form to buy extra units. You might have to fill out an application form to sell your units. It becomes then a, a one week, two week, three week process to be able to put money in or take money out, which is enormously different and um, to, to a direct investment. The other thing that particularly, um, or, you know, I'm not a, I think an indirect investment has a time and a place in a portfolio if you can't get the same exposure via direct. I'm, much, I'm a big proponent of direct investment, but I'm also conscious that for diversification reasons, sometimes direct investment is not, doesn't offer you an alternative and therefore indirect through a managed fund is, is another way of doing that or the only way of doing that. But, but you need to be careful because, I mean, a lot of people got burnt through the, the GFC through 2008, 2009, where indirect investments, um, uh, they effectively froze funds, uh, particularly property funds back then. Um, and then what happened was investors had no liquidity, 
um, then it took some of them it took a matter of years before they were unfrozen and and that meant that retirees um, were, were left in the lurch as far as access to money or income levels were um, severely disadvantaged so I think that there are a number of issues um, and things you need to consider when comparing indirect investment and direct um, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach but make sure you understand what you're buying and how you're buying it so the, the real last big topic I want to talk about um, today that's in your notes is really talking about gearing and margin lending. Now, this is a topic that um, needs a lot of uh, understanding and, and far goes beyond probably just the talk that we need to have today around it. But, but gearing and margin lending is effectively, in essence, borrowing to invest in the share market. Now, I'm going to talk about margin lending particularly um, there are two ways, you, could, you know, predominant ways we see people can borrow to invest in the share market. Um, margin lending is, is one and it's probably the higher risk way to do it. So in a borrowing sense, if you have a share portfolio and you've already got $50,000 or $100,000 worth of shares, you can use that portfolio, you lodge it with an appropriate um, margin lender and what they do is they keep that that $100,000 as collateral and give you a loan to use against that. Now that loan you can use then to buy more shares. So you might start with a $100,000 bundle of shares, you then go to lodge that collateral and they might and say right well you can go now buy another $100,000 worth of shares using borrowed funds. So it ends up being a $200,000 portfolio of which you've borrowed $100,000 worth of, of have $100,000 borrowed. It's because of the, the fluctuating share prices and the nature of um, the, the quick movements in this market or in shares, what margin lending will be is a, it's a higher cost of borrowing. So you'll find at the moment, for example, if you go and use this mechanism to borrow money, it might cost you between 5 and 5.5% as opposed to a, an investment loan against your house of 3%. So you have to be very aware of uh, how you use margin lending, what's the investment cost and um, what investment and what, what are the benefits you're getting out of it. Um, we, we talk about three forms of gearing um, when we're talking about borrowing to invest in shares. We talk about neutral gearing where the, that $200,000 worth of shares, for example, we used in the example before, that produces a certain level of income with dividends and those dividends are used to pay the interest costs on the loan or make the repayments on the loan. That's what we call neutral, it's, it's washing its own face. Um, where you talk about here the term positive gearing, it's where the portfolio of, is, reduce, is producing more income than is needed to pay off the loan. So it's actually generating more cash flow and it means the, the portfolio loan should then be reducing as the cash flow comes in and, and pays the loan back. And the last term that's most commonly used around the place is negative gearing. Negative gearing and the word negative should give it away. It means that the portfolio is generating less income than the interest costs on the, on the loan. So it might be that you're producing $5,000 worth of income from the portfolio the interest costs on the loan might be $7,000, which means you have to tip in another $2,000 to make sure the loan is serviced properly. People, a lot of people ask me, well, what, Tony, what's the benefit of doing negative gearing? And, and, and quite clearly, negative gearing, you're losing money. You're losing money um, year by year on that, on that shortfall. You are hoping, and when I say hoping, you are making the assumption that the shares will rise in capital value by more than you are losing. That's the way that overall you're better off, but you must keep an eye on this stuff. If people go into negative gearing blindly, can end up losing a lot of money and you must be very, very careful about it. While we're just on the topic of margin lending, I just want to talk, make sure you clearly understand what a margin call is and where the margin provider may force you to sell shares um, due to market collapses such as GFC or COVID. Um, they, this was probably the biggest problem I saw back in 2007, 2008. A number of people got pretty gung-ho, they were borrowing money through margin lenders and then because the market fell quite quickly and un in, in really unexpectedly, um, people were then forced to sell shares at really bad times just to pay the bank back. Now as we've said in earlier videos, never be a forced seller of an asset at any time. So use margin lending wisely, be very clear about what your risk management is and have backup plans if you use it. 
The second way of borrowing to buy shares, which is now a, probably even I would argue a more commonly used version to borrow, is to use your house as collateral. So you might do a, um, typically we find a lot of people build up equity in their house. They've got their home loan down to a manageable figure of say $300,000. They might be able to borrow, do a split loan, borrow another $100,000 against the home and use that $100,000 to go buy a share portfolio. That is, means that two things are probably done and have advantages over margin lending with this. One is you get a cheaper interest rate. So the interest rate on a split loan like that would be typically at the moment be between three and 3.5%. The other advantage is you don't get caught in this um, margin call position which we alluded to earlier. If the share market falls substantially, you're not going to call from getting a call from your bank to ask for their money back because the collateral is held against the property, not against the shares. So you don't run the risk of being a full seller of the asset at any time. And that is a major advantage and, can, and, and as a risk management mechanism is, is, is a much better way of doing it. A lot of people don't feel comfortable putting the house up as collateral for these types of investment loans, um, but it's something that you should, um, if you're considering growing your assets over the long term and want some tax advantages, speak to your advisor about this and make sure you're crystal clear on the pros and cons of it. Thanks for joining us today. It's been great having you talk through some of these issues. Make sure you read the notes that we've sent out um, that accompany this and I look forward to seeing you for the uh, final session in, um, next week.